the sound of silence, Matthew 27, 11 to 14. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? He did not answer him with regard to even a single charge, so that the governor was quite amazed. If what you've been asked to imagine up to now has been easy, you're now going to be asked the impossible. Listen to silence. The silence when Jesus is accused. He gave no answer. Silence. What a contrast to the rowdy crowd scenes we've been listening to so far. It's disturbing when an accused person doesn't bother to offer any defense, especially when the allegations are so serious. You don't know what to make of him. Normally, a person, whether guilty or not, will be quick to offer a defense, or at the very least, to plead mitigating circumstances. And when what is at stake is your life, surely you would have something to say, anything to save yourself. Do you not hear how many things they testify against you, said Pilate, but Jesus gave no answer not even a single charge. He never said a murmuring word. Not a word, not a single word. Yet how powerful a word could, could have been. In this trial, a few carefully chosen words would have won Jesus' freedom and Barabbas would have been kept under lock and key. Ask any political journalist and you will hear about the power of words to influence people and sway public opinion. Unscrupulous p politicians know how easy it can be to destroy opponents, or at least to make things difficult for them simply by innuendo. There is a story told of an incident that took place during the Second World War. A non-commissioned officer who was learning to drill the soldiers on the grassy slope above the chalky white cliffs and beachy head overlooking the English Channel. Backwards and forwards the men went turning and wheeling, first one way, then another. What a feeling it was to have power over these men. They did whatever he told them. Suddenly the officer had a terrifying thought. It almost paralyzed him. The soldiers were heading straight towards the edge of the cliff. He realized that if he didn't stop them, they were so well disciplined, they would probably march right over the edge and the men behind would be pushing the ones in front. He pictured them as a stream of lemmings. In panic, he shouted, stop. Nothing happened, come back. They kept going, turn around. But they kept their back to him, marching towards the cliff. In, in his blind terror, he had forgotten the one word that would stop them. What was that word? Nothing else would work. They were only yards from the cliff edge when the Sergeant Major's voice, voice bellowed from behind him. Company, halt! That was the word, halt. Powerful things, words, aren't they? And yet, here we have Jesus refusing to use a single word. It is remarkable, after all, we call him the word, the word made flesh. St. John's Gospel begins with that beautiful passage we read at midnight Christmas, where he portrays such all-powerful words. The word that brought about creation, leaving behind all the splendor and light and becoming human. The powerful becoming powerless. St. Paul puts it beautifully in his letter to the Philippians. Christ Jesus was in the form of God, but he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. In the bowed head silence of Jesus, we can hear that self-emptying Paul and John are on about. In the upper room, he laid aside his own garments and put on a towel, the garb of a slave. Here before Pilate, he laid aside his defense and took on silence, a sign of his solidarity with all who are weak and powerless, those who have no voice or whose voice is drowned out in the clamor or simply ignored. But unlike the signs of Judas, and Pilate, the self-emptying of Jesus is not an empty sign. He's not putting on a show. This is for real. 
he's really not going to offer a defense. He's putting aside his power, even at the cost of his own life. The silence says it all. In the silence now, think of the silence of Jesus. Wonder at his willingness to be powerless and let us confess our own love of power and our fear of losing whatever power we have, whether at home, in the wider family, in the community, even in the church. And let us contrast our quickness to speak with Jesus' willingness to remain silent. Let us pray. We worship you, O Christ, the eternal word, because for our sake you laid aside your power and your glory. You clothed yourself in a garment of our humanity to live in poverty here on earth and to suffer death upon a cross. Speak to us through your silence. Teach us the lesson of your humility and empty our lives of all pride and of all selfishness that we may find our joy and our fulfillment in serving others in your name and for your sake.